Welcome to section 38 of the viruses. This is the overview figure showing all the viruses you need to know for step one. In this section, we'll be discussing poliovirus, which you can see right here. The story of poliovirus takes place in a sweet little village. Historically, this village has been undisturbed from any intrusion, and that's a good thing. Look at how beautiful this area is. It's got this red, warm, inviting sky. This red, warm color scheme in the sky indicates that this is an RNA virus, as you have likely learned from previous videos. So red warm colors for RNA virus. To top it all off, there's a rainbow. Rainbows usually fill people with positive feelings when they spot them. So this will help you remember that poliovirus is a positive sense virus. And if you notice the asteroids in the top right, and those are freaking you out a little bit, I'd warn you that this village has more pressing matters to deal with. In fact, it's being invaded right now by an evil emperor and his henchmen. They are using poles like this to pole vault across the river. I guess deep down the henchmen are scaredy cats and they don't want to get wet at all or they just can't jump the smallest of streams. So anyways, this pole represents poliovirus. Now what's he pointing at? The asteroids. As we can see, this large asteroid is breaking into several smaller asteroids as it descends toward the Earth. This represents the fact that once the positive sense poliovirus gets translated, a single large protein is formed. This large protein is then cleaved into several smaller functional viral proteins. So again, one big asteroid breaking into several smaller asteroids stands for one large viral protein being cleaved into several smaller viral proteins. Now let's dive into some of the nefarious activities of the emperor's henchmen. Look back here to this little innocent panda. This little panda was just folding some socks like his mom asked him to, and this invading ox henchman comes and stabs him in the head with a needle. That's awful. Well, sock sounds like sulk. And this needle stabbing the poor panda folding the socks represents the sulk vaccine. Socks are just lifeless pieces of laundry, so when you think of this sulk vaccine, remember the lifeless socks. That way you will always remember that the sulk vaccine is lifeless, or rather, a killed vaccine. Now these oxen captured one of the would-be heroes of our story. It looks like a tiger there. And one of these henchmen used this big poker to torment the hostages. And on that poker you can see they've written, Live Sabertooth Tiger. They do this to humiliate the tiger and make her feel like a zoo animal that everyone can just come and look at for entertainment. Those jerks. Anyways, the word saber kind of sounds like Sabin, as in the Sabin vaccine for polio. And the Sabin vaccine is a live vaccine. So when you think of the words live saber tooth tiger written on that cruel poker, remember that the Sabin vaccine is live. Now look at this evil alligator henchman running into the river. What's he running from? Well, some of the panda villagers have started defending their territory. These two pandas are chasing him away, showing the emperor they won't get pushed around anymore. Now what does that say on his shirt? His shirt says IRS on it, like Internal Revenue Service. Like oppressive kings in the Middle Ages, this villainous emperor oppresses his subjects through excessive taxation. Now this symbol is not a dig at the IRS of the United States, but most of us are familiar that the IRS taxes people. So. IRS is what we will call these henchmen, alligator, tax enforcers. And in this instance, IRS stands for IRES, which means Internal Ribosomal Entry Site. Now this image demonstrates translation within the cell's cytoplasm, and it's discussed in great detail in the molecular biology chapter. I only want to draw your attention to one area, the small subunit binding to the mRNA. mRNA, which you can see right here, normally has a 5' guanine cap, which you can see labeled right here and this cap is recognized by the small ribosomal subunit. From there, it triggers the pairing and translation of the mRNA. Now, picornaviruses are positive sense, as we previously discussed. This means that upon entering the cell, the positive sense virus can be immediately translated by the host ribosomes. However, picornaviruses lack this 5' guanine cap. So, how do the host ribosomes recognize the viral mRNA? Well, the small subunits actually recognize it a different way, through the internal ribosomal entry site that's located on the virus. Now this internal ribosomal entry site is so important to the infectivity of picornaviruses that we created a way for you to remember it, the IRS henchman. So when you think of the IRS henchman, think of the IRES in picornaviruses. Now the panda revolt continues as this villager has ripped off the clothes of his taxing oppressor. Now look at that gator, out of uniform and naked. Good thing there's a black box covering up certain areas. Anyways, this naked henchman represents the fact that polio is a naked virus, meaning it lacks an envelope. So naked henchman for naked virus. Now look at this naked henchman. He got his clothes ripped off and then he just dove right into the river to escape the panda fury. It's almost like the naked henchman is getting swallowed up by the river. This swallowing represents how naked viruses enter host cells through endocytosis. Now we can look at this naked henchman floating down the river. That river is pretty nasty and brown. Well, that brown river represents the intestines. Notice how it intersects with this other, more red looking river. Unfortunately, upstream of the red river, there's a major bloodbath going on and it's kind of spilling into this river. Anyways, this red river represents the bloodstream. The fact that the henchman is floating from the intestine river and entering the blood river represents how poliovirus enters the intestines and from there gets absorbed into the bloodstream. And once in the bloodstream, the virus can go all kinds of places. 
If you follow that blood river, you can see it flows into that water mill in the background. The natural flow of water generates the energy this village requires. In fact, this water mill is so central to the day-to-day -day functionality of the village that they even call it the central facility, which you can see written on the front of it. And you can see a bunch of poles from the pole vaulting oxen pile up at the entrance of the central facility. So what is this all about? Well, the central facility represents the central nervous system, and the most damaging place that poliovirus can go is the central nervous system. Once there, it causes all kinds of issues. So again, the poles traveling through the blood river and clogging up the central facility stands for poliovirus entering the bloodstream and infecting the central nervous system. Now the pandas are really disrupting the emperor's hostile takeover. You can see this panda pounding on one of the oxen who jumped the stream. After being hit, the oxen looks pretty delirious, indicating that the hit was effective. It even smashed the hat on the ox. Now good thing these pandas know kung fu. Anyways, this hat, as well as getting hit in the head, represent meningitis. And that makes sense. After all, poliovirus enters the central nervous system. So it makes sense that it would cause an infection there, like meningitis. Now this oxen closest to us has been grabbed by the horns and is being manhandled, or I guess, panda handled. Anyways, this grabbing of the ox horns represents the anterior horns of the spinal cord. This image demonstrates the cortical spinal tract, and it's described in great detail in the neurology physiology chapter. We won't go into all that detail here. Right now, I only want you to know that the cortical spinal tract is how your brain controls movement of your body. It's made up of two neurons, an upper motor neuron, which you can see right here, and this will travel down from the brain and reach the anterior horn of the spinal cord. That upper motor neuron will synapse here to the lower motor neuron, which you can see labeled here. This lower motor neuron then carries motor information to the neuromuscular junction, or NMJ. From there, it can stimulate the appropriate muscles to move, for example, the arms and legs. And this anterior horn is directly attacked in polio. And since the anterior horn houses the cell body of the lower motor neuron, damage here will result in lower motor neuron signs. Lower motor neuron signs include weakness and paralysis, as well as fasciculations and atrophy. Don't worry, we have a symbol for each one of these. So going back to that horn-grabbing panda, we can see that he's shaking that ox around. You can even see those shake lines as the ox gets jiggled. This represents fasciculations. Fasciculations are involuntary muscle twitches that occur with lower motor neuron damage. And I think it's safe to say that this ox is getting shaken around involuntarily. So shaking ox for fasciculations. Now the panda over here has beaten this ox to a pulp, and that ox is now weak and tired and limp. Look at his arms and legs dangling helplessly. Being so limp makes it look like he's paralyzed. This limp paralysis represents the weakness and flaccid paralysis that can occur with lower motor neuron damage. So who's this emperor we've been talking about? It's this guy. As you can see, he's a peacock. Like most male peacocks, this guy thinks he's better than everyone else. Anyways, peacock sounds like picornavirus. Poliovirus is one of the picornaviruses that you need to know about. And this evil peacock emperor carries his royal stick around. As you can see, it has this fancy jewel on the top of it. The jewel has an icosahedral shape to it. This represents the fact that poliovirus has an icosahedral capsid. Thankfully, this peacock emperor got what was coming to him. As you can see, the pandas have tied him up. That sends a pretty solid signal the emperor should leave this village alone from now on. Anyways, look at his arms. It looks like he's been defeathered, now revealing his wispy little arms. He's not strong at all. Maybe he got weak from being a spoiled emperor for so long. And we could call that atrophy. This atrophied emperor will help you remember the atrophy that results from lower motor neuron damage. Now let's look at this panda here. He was the one who disarmed the emperor peacock with his trusty axe. The panda now sits here proudly breaking the axe with only his powerful kung fu fist. If you look closely, this axe has the appearance of a set of lungs. Many of the muscles that get weak and atrophied from lower motor neuron damage are muscles that help expand the thoracic cavity. If weak, the lungs will not expand fully. The diaphragm might work, but it takes more than just the diaphragm to expand the entire chest wall. For this reason, polio patients often experience respiratory failure. So breaking lung-shaped axe stands for respiratory failure. If you look back here, there's two pandas roasting intestines over an open fire. It's kind of weird that they're eating intestines. Don't worry though, just because this story has humanoid and intelligent pandas, oxen and a peacock, and some alligators, doesn't mean that all the animals in this universe are intelligent. So you should feel rest assured that these intestines the pandas are eating are from non-intelligent or non-sentient beings. My point is, is that the pandas are the good guys. But what you should really know is that the intestines represent enterovirus. Enteroviruses is a descriptive category that polioviruses fall into. And the term simply means that the virus can replicate within the intestines. This also means that the virus can often spread to the central nervous system, as we've discussed earlier. Now let's take a second to talk about the non-CNS symptoms polio can cause. See this guy vomiting? Yep, polio can cause vomiting. The other guy doesn't look so good either. This poor sweating panda looks the way many of us feel when we describe malaise. His eyes make him look unfocused and exhausted. Anyways, these two intestine-eating pandas stand for the generic signs of infection that accompany a polio infection. 
So think fever, malaise, sweating, headache, and of course, nausea and vomiting. Now these pandas aren't cruel. You can see that the defeated oxen are sent off in a line, forced out of the village. Their safe exit, of course, implies that the pandas didn't murder their oppressors. Anyways, this line of oxen will help you remember that polio is a linear virus. On his way out, this ox stepped in some poop. He's pretty disgusted that he stepped in the poop and is now complaining to the march-enforcing panda. The panda has no sympathy. The oxen just attacked his village. Why should he feel bad? Anyways, this poo represents the fact that polio has fecal-oral transmission. Now that we've covered everything in the image, let's do a question to apply this. A 14-year-old previously healthy girl presents to the emergency department due to vomiting, sweating, and muscle weakness. She recently emigrated from Southeast Asia and has not received any vaccinations in her life. Her temperature is 38.6 degrees Celsius, or... 101.5 degrees Fahrenheit. On physical exam, she appears diaphoretic, fatigued, and drags her left leg as she walks. Her strength is 1 out of 5 in her left lower extremity, 3 out of 5 in her right lower extremity, 4 out of 5 in her left upper extremity, and 4 out of 5 in her right upper extremity. The physician suspects a picornavirus infection. Which of the following is inconsistent with her condition? A. Gray matter of the anterior spinal cord has been damaged. B. Upper motor neuron signs should be expected. C. The illness may have been prevented with a live Sabin vaccine. Her condition may cause low inspiratory capacity. Or E. Sensation to all extremities is likely to remain intact. So, we know that this is a picornavirus. And her presentation is consistent with a polio infection. She's vomiting, sweating, and she has muscle weakness. In fact, she's so weak that her left leg drags as she walks. This indicates the asymmetric weakness of her extremities on neuro exam. With all this in mind, the only answer that's not consistent with a polio infection is choice B, which claims that upper motor neuron signs should be expected. This is false. You should not expect upper motor neuron signs, you should expect lower motor neuron signs. Recall that the anterior horn is damaged, right here. And this really only impacts the cell body of the lower motor neuron, right here. Again, the anterior horn is represented with this ox getting grabbed by the horns. Now, A is incorrect because this statement is consistent with polio. The anterior spinal cord has been damaged, so A is wrong. Now, C is also wrong because it's consistent with polio. A live Sabin vaccine could have prevented this infection. Remember that poking stick that said live saber-toothed tiger? D is incorrect because this statement is also consistent with polio. Her condition can result in muscle weakness, which will decrease her inspiratory capacity. Now, for more information on flow cytometry, please see the respiratory physiology chapter. Finally, choice E is also a bad choice because this statement is consistent with polio. Because we know that the nerve that's damaged is the lower motor neuron. So we're not expecting damage to the other tracts which are responsible for sensation. And that should be everything you need to know about polio.